Thanks for joining us today. We believe God is going to do great things in your life and we want to hear about it. Send us your story at mystory@summitasay.com and let us know what he's done for you through this ministry. If you'd like to partner with us or bless us with a financial gift, go to summitasay.com and give an amount that works best for you. Now enjoy the message and have a blessed day. Well, we begin a brand new series this week called The Pursuit of Happy. I took the title from Will Smith's movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, right? And I'll throw a few curveballs in here that might make you think something you didn't think before. Think for just a moment about the happiest person you know. You know, not fake, but authentically joyful, grateful in their life, confident in God, optimistic about their future. I mean, they breathe life and energy into you. Who wouldn't want to spend time around that kind of a person? Well, that ought to be you. If you're a believer, that ought to be you. Now think about the most joy-challenged person you know. Negative, bitter, complainer. Think about that person. Don't look at them. Just think about it. (laughs) Nobody wants to spend time with that person. Or we've been told, go to a real happy place like Disneyland. And all of us that have raised little children have been. When it's 98 degrees, 100 degrees humidity, the kids are crying, the line is an hour and a half, and it ain't happy. Anybody join me on that one? A clinical psychologist wrote, and I believe it to be true in life, life is so constructed that the event does not, cannot, and will not ever match the expectation. It's never as good as you thought. It's never as bad as you thought. That's just the way life is. Well, what if our church was one of the happiest places in town? What if you and I reached our full potential of joy, whatever God knows that to be, so that when somebody came to our church, even if they didn't know anything about the Bible, felt their life was too messed up, that when they came in, People embraced them, and they were generally interested in them, made time and space for them. The other day, I had a flat tire, and I was at discount tire getting it fixed, and it was super crowded, and I had to wait, and a young lady behind me was waiting, and we got to giggling about uh, how slow this whole thing is. Anyway, we both went over and sat down about an hour and had to wait, engaged in a conversation. Well, I came to find out she's from Jamaica. She's a a gorgeous young adult and highly educated, articulate. She had her braided hair. And when she said, Jamaica, I said, Jamaica, man. (laughs) You know, you're just involuntary. I watch too many movies. Anyway, (laughs) she giggled. But make a long story short, she's a believer. And In her journey, it just struck me, she went to one of the largest churches in our city, predominantly all white, and uh, when she went in, one of the women there came up to her and told her, you're not our kind of people. Can you, can you believe that? I looked right at her and I said, Kareem, we are. We are, baby. I couldn't believe such a thing was said. Don't know anything about her. That woman, I said, I'd give a week's pay if I could have stood by you when that old girl said that to you in that lobby. I would have been, I'd have melted her pantyhose. I'd, I'd have, I would have taken her down. But that is, listen to me, I'm going somewhere. That's a culture. That is a culture, and it is a responsibility of a leader in a business or in a church, in any organization, even an airline, to develop the culture. Otherwise, it's by default. Maybe the leader doesn't believe that. Maybe the believer doesn't share that view. But because he doesn't enforce it, then the culture prevails. And no matter what his vision is, culture will eat your vision for lunch. And that's why I'm always talking about that, because all of you have got a background where some culture has pressed in on you that's absolutely contrary to clear Scripture. Church is for anybody. All kinds of people make up a church. 
Jesus didn't build a church for the select people or a race of people. When he came, he destroyed all those barriers. And we just keep erecting them. But I don't want to be known that way. And when you say we're a friendly church, a lot of churches say that. What they really ought to say is, yeah, we're friendly to our people, meaning all your friends. But what about people that look different, are different, that you don't recognize? They're the ones that need the embrace. So I want you, whatever your race is, when you see people, if you're a member here or you're a regular, and you see our culture is everybody is welcome. And you walk up, interrupt them, push in. Maybe they're shy. Maybe they're uh, not, not extroverted. Just push in with warmth because everybody loves that. And that ice begins to melt. I remember going to an all-black church, and sometimes they can be just like an all-white or all-Hispanic, same culture, and you can feel very isolated. But when several of the deacons and a couple of the sisters came over, embraced me and welcomed me, the ice started to melt, and I started to feel like, hey, maybe I really am accepted here. You've got to give everybody that feeling. They don't just, I'm not cute enough to give everybody that feeling. <laughs> it's a family deal. It's a culture deal. And I mean, I stand by it. And I don't care if you're on United Airlines. I, I tweeted the other day, if, if we run out of seats, I promise you, we will not drag you down the aisle and give your seat to somebody else. <laughs> See, that's culture, and somebody's not enforcing it. So I want you to be on your toes about that. That is very meaningful to me and to God. What if people, when they heard the word Christian, instead of thinking, judge, by the way, I named that church, just sitting, I said, I bet it's, she said, how'd you know? I said, well, I've lived here 30 years, I know. <laughs> what if when people heard the word Christian, instead of thinking judgmental, self-righteous, they thought about the word joy? Did you know that depression is 10 times more prevalent in our day than in the 1960s? That's when I was in high school and college. The average age for the onset of depression 50 years ago was 29 and a half. The average age for the onset of depression today is 14 and a half. No kid 14 years old ought to carry that kind of a burden. So we're not meant to live life without joy. Tell some Christians that, would you? So our new series is The Pursuit of Happy, and joy is the theme in the book of Philippians. The word joy and rejoicing occur 14 times in those four little chapters of the book of Philippians. And Paul wrote this book, yeah, when he was in prison, not Disneyland, in chains, in disgrace, after having been beaten, and he had almost nothing we associate with a happy life. Yet he couldn't stop talking about joy. I'm reading out of Philippians 1, first eight verses. This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with great joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it till now. And I'm certain that God who began a good work in you will continue his work until it's finished on the day that Jesus Christ returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. That's an amazing letter that starts with the truth about a joyful life. Paul starts off, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. He doesn't say apostles. He doesn't say prophet. He says slaves. Now, normally, when Paul wrote a letter, he would say, Paul called to be an apostle, but he doesn't do it. Why? Well, it's interesting to note that when these letters called epistles were sent to churches, they were in different cultures, ethnic groups, geographical locations, and each letter 
used verbiage that would appeal to the way people thought in that culture. It wasn't one size fits all. It was tailored for that culture. So here's Philippi. It's an elite colony of Rome, and it is the most status-oriented society in the ancient world. It's the Beverly Hills. It's the elite class. It is Roman status, ladder climbing to the hilt. Well, it was built on the pursuit of honor, self-advancement, and self-attainment. So in Philippi, the way to success was climb the ladder, baby. So Paul starts by using a word to describe himself nobody in the Roman Empire would ever use. It was degrading. I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm not the master of a real pleasant life, but I'm a servant of a great cause, the cause of Christ. And that brings us to the happiness paradox. Here it goes. You will never be happy if the ultimate goal of your life is to be happy. You will never be happy if the ultimate goal of your life is for you to be happy. What you have to learn is that happy is a byproduct. It is never the goal. It comes as a result of certain conditions. It's not something you get if that's the main thing you want. There, I mean, how many celebrity sports and movie stars or entertainers have everything we would consider to be happy, and they can't stay off drugs or suicide? Some, somebody, something's missing, right? I'm just being an observer. So there's something better and more important than the happy life, and it's called the meaningful life. So there's a difference between life devoted to meaning and a life devoted to just being happy. I just want to be happy. I've heard young people say that a hundred times. Happiness without meaning becomes self-centered and shallow, and it never lasts. I'll be happy if things go well, if my needs are met, if I can get my body mass down to whatever, if my desires are satisfied, if I could just get a date with that hunk of hunk of burning love if I can avoid pain, if everybody likes me, if I had smaller hips. I won't go any further. All right. People who don't have a job think I'll be happy when I get a job. Then they get a job, and it's got pressures and problems, challenges, and people you don't like. And they think, well, I'll be happy when I retire. It's kind of interesting that word retire is not anywhere in the Bible. Did you know that? So when people retire, happy goes up for a little while, but their sense of meaning actually goes down. People don't have money. They think if I had money, I'd be happy. So they get more money, and they're a little happy for a little while. They get a bigger house, better clothes, more stuff, and happiness goes up for a little while, but meaning actually goes down. People don't have kids. They think, I'll be happy if I just had kids, really. So they have kids. <laughs> And they think, I'll be happy when I get these little suckers out of the house. And there's a fantasy about children. You know, the number one word that comes up on Google, if you type in, is my two-year-old, is the word gifted. That will validate my genetic contribution to the human race, and I'll be happy because they're gifted. Well, then you get that little kid. And it's dirty diapers and bottles and crying and temper tantrums and exhaustion and sleep deprivation. And you discover having children is exhausting, it's costly, it's stressful, it's draining. And after people have children, happy actually goes down. <laughs> Did you know that marital satisfaction goes up when they leave? Did you know that? That's true. So being a parent doesn't make happy go up. In fact, the number one phrase we parents use on our children is, I'll give you something to be happy about. <laughs> so being a parent doesn't make happy go up. It makes meaning go up. And when people get to the end of their lives, it's actually meaning and purpose, not happy, that matters the most. God made us so that we would actually grow and enjoy when we choose the meaningful life. So if you aim at meeting, meaningful life, you get happy thrown in as a byproduct. If you aim at happy, you don't get happy or meaning. 
So let's talk about the pursuit of a meaningful life that brings joy. And I want to give you four observations. Observation one, joy comes when I practice acts of kindness and generosity. Joy comes when I practice acts of kindness and generosity. Now we think, typically we think, I'll be happy when I get what I want. But actually, happiness comes when I give of what I have. Paul says to this Philippian status-seeking Roman culture, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who actually took on the nature of a slave, who said he didn't come to be served, what we associate with a happy life, serve me, but to serve and to give his life for many. And serving is the meaningful life. So since that doesn't come naturally to we fallen humans, we have to ask Jesus to help us. Now, folks, typically we're selfish and lazy and don't want to serve. And if you don't believe that, have children. Just watch. That Adamic nature, boom, it's right there. It's right there. You never hear, oh, mother, I'll get that. Oh, mother, I decided to make your bed. I noticed it wasn't yet, and I know you have many things to do. Never happens ever happens. I mean, till the day they walk out the door. Sally, you didn't clean your room. You didn't make your bed. Pick that stuff up off the floor. I got to clean our house and your room too. You're old enough to get clean. I can hear those phrases my wife used so many times. And now we do it with the grandkids. And so our attitude is let somebody else do it. It's not my job. They don't pay me to do that. We don't want to do it in business. We don't want to do it in church. And God knows we don't want to do it in marriage. But if you're going to go the distance without an attorney and a divorce court, you're going to find out marriage is serving one another. And you don't feel like it all the time. So tough. If you don't want to serve, then don't get married. Or you won't be married long. So we think we'll be happy when we get what we want. But it turns out joy is associated more with what we give than what we get. The greatest boost to joy is doing something for someone else. It's a big kick. It is. Even something small, like give a cup of water in my name, Jesus said. Run an errand for somebody. Loan something to someone that's helpful. Voluntarily help somebody with a project. Bake a cake for somebody for no reason. Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, you did it unto me. And that produces meaning. And that's so important. Second observation, suffering, pain can interrupt the happy life, but pain and suffering is powerless to stop a meaningful life. It's easy to be troubled by all the news today, domestically, internationally. But if you read, especially the Gospels, you often find great joy in the middle of great affliction or suffering. It's like a little flower that comes up in a crack in your sidewalk. You can't hold it back. When Paul was in Philippi, he did not have what we would call a happy life. They beat him. He was in prison. It was horrible. He ran into opposition for the Chamber of Commerce proclaiming the gospel of Jesus because all the retailers are going to lose money. They made off selling these little man-made idols that everybody worshiped. So Paul was falsely accused, stripped of his clothes, beaten severely, thrown in jail, feet put in stocks. And the Philippians said, we'll give you something to be happy about. And look at his response in Acts 16. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. In the middle of wealth, in the middle of status, in Philippi, two prisoners make a little dungeon the happiest place on earth. And you know what they were singing? It's a small world. (laughs) I just made that up. Okay, it's not in the Bible. So how should we respond to suffering? Imagine a funeral where it was said of the person who died, because of all the suffering in the world, she went through her entire life refusing joy. She lived a morose, negative, cynical life and cultivated a life of chronic despair in solidarity with sufferers everywhere. Well, la-ti-da, that wouldn't help anybody, 
would it? The best response to suffering is not hopelessness, it's usefulness. Think about it. The best prayer in a suffering world is, God, make me useful. Not God, make me miserable. Make me useful. Help me alleviate suffering with what I have, where I am, with, with what I can do. Ah, that's a meaningful life in the midst of suffering. I can help a child through World Vision, Compassion International, a number of outreaches. I can help a suffering friend through a visit, a phone call, a note, prayer. Some of you here may be going through a season of suffering right now. You've lost a job, maybe you've lost money, you've lost your wealth, or you get a bad medical diagnosis. Someone you love has died, someone lost a baby, maybe you're in deep depression. So what do you do in a dark time? Well, the first thing is, don't be embarrassed to identify it. Absolutely. There's no shame in that. Sadly, in our culture, there is. But everybody experiences moments of depression. God does not want you to live a depressed life, please, ever. But has anybody in here but me ever felt some depression? Yeah, I do. The Sunday after Easter, I do. And I see, where did 7,000 people go? I felt a little tinge of depression, but it's not going to control my life, and it's not wrong to walk up to a close friend and say, man, I'm disgusted today. I I am so depressed today. Now, they're going to shake out of it. They're going to be fine. I'm going to tell you why in a little bit, but, but the point is, God didn't want you to live depressed, but it's not wrong to say, man, I'm feeling lower than a whale's belly, or as uh, Elton John's song, uh, Help, you know. I'm feeling down, down, down. I never needed anybody's help. Anybody know the song? You guys. <laughs> you guys ain't hip, okay? I'm just saying, help me if you can. I'm feeling down. What did I say? I am so sorry. I am so sorry. Sorry, Beatles. Yeah. That's it. I'm depressed. Now I, uh, how did I, I play it on the guitar? How did I miss that? I guess because I was talking about Elton. Okay. Joy is dependent on who I am, how I'm loved, more than my circumstances. It is happiness, listen, it's happiness that always takes a hit when circumstances go bad. The first thing, not joy, happy. Happy comes from the Scandinavian word hap, which is connected to our word happenings, circumstances. And so our circumstances are just too wild and varied to build that as a foundation for my feeling about life. So I have to depend on what God says about life and what He says He is and what He says I am or else my circumstances could cause me to just go berserk and lose my hope and my confidence about embracing the bad circumstances. So I'd rather face darkness full on than try to put on a fake happy mask. So our church is a community for broken people, not all stars, not superstars. Summit is not a place for got it all under control, everything good, normal, healthy people because they don't exist. That's right. This is a place for real people, not all together people. No fake happy mass here. Nobody's perfect here, as I just proved. (laughs) But it's a place where meaning will always win. Psalms 30, verse 5, weeping may last for a night. I don't know how long your night's been, but joy comes in the morning. And your morning is coming. Might be next week, next month, next year. Maybe it's a resurrection, but that sucker's coming. Morning is coming. That's hope. See, that's meaning. When my happy goes out the door, my meaning stays put right there. Number three, observation. Meaning comes when I invest deeply in personal relationships. 
Meaning comes when I invest deeply in personal relationships. And that's what meaning is about. I'll prove it. Relationships. And you see it with Paul in his letter to the Philippians. He starts out, I thank my God every time I think about you. Now, when he was in Philippi, they certainly were not that nice to him. He had a lot of bad memories. But you get to choose the memory you're going to dwell on. I've lost some friends to death and suicide. I choose to remember or eulogize them in their good times as I knew them. Not the bad times, not when they went nuts or off the rails, right? He said, I thank my God every time I think about you. So Paul isn't reminiscing about the beating and imprisonment. He's remembering those people in Philippi in the church that helped him. He said, every time I remember you, I'm grateful in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with great joy. See, mostly life is about relationships. And our world, our culture will try to get you to forget that. It will say, Come on, bet the farm on climbing the ladder, being successful, achieving more, impressing more, on having more. But I'm going to tell you something. No one has unhappy relationships and a happy life. Doesn't exist. And I've never known anybody with joyful relationships and an unhappy life. I think one of the riches of my life are the close friends that are in it, relationships. They've added to me. They've encouraged me. They've pushed me up. They've helped me to reach higher uh, when I didn't feel like it. They believed in me when I didn't. And I can think back positively about those people when they could have been easier to criticize than to affirm me. I hope you have some people like that. Every, that's why I try to get you out of your box to build some relationships. You may be sitting in the same section in here as somebody who could fix something you're going through right now or add value to your life, and you don't even know it. Oh, you know, you're a Texan. You're the lone star Christian. You're not going to go to a small group. You're not going to go meet new people, get in a team. But that's how you grow. I, t- I was telling a couple in our, uh, our Summit Life class up there at 9 o'clock, I said, I was with Charles Tremendous Jones, a great Christian motivational speaker. He's in heaven for years. But back in the early 60s, he said, Rick, you will never change or grow except for the books you read, people you meet, and uh, places you go. It expands your worldview. I remember I I graduated from a couple of colleges, University of South Carolina, and then I did seminary. And I can remember a seminary professor say, well, God won't do this, and God won't use you if you don't believe that. And then I traveled the world, and I came back. And I said, Professor, God doesn't believe everything you do. (laughs) That's a fact, folks. God's a lot bigger And you'll find out when you get out, meet people, embrace, learn, wow, it's like you grow. And then when you go back into that little dipstick culture you came out of, you can't stay there anymore. It doesn't feel good. It's just too small. You can't wear it. You've grown. You got bigger in a good way, bigger, right? I've told you many times about going back to my home church, and they're still singing the same song. People look like they're about 93 with cobwebs on them. They hadn't changed anything. So there's no life and no growth and nothing. nothing. It's like, hadn't you learned anything new at all? Have you ever heard of the internet? Have you ever gone and looked at a podcast? It reminds me of a rooster who took a vacation. He went to South Africa, and when he came back, he brought in a big ostrich egg. And he brought it into the hen house, and he said, girls, come here. I don't mean to complain, but I'd like you to see what they're doing in other places. (laughs) See? Some of you live too small. Now, you'll remember that rooster, won't you? A secular study found that changes in people's income actually brought very little change in their happiness. But an increase in relationships was worth more than $100,000 a year in life satisfaction. Wow. So financially, Paul's dirt poor. Relationally, he's filthy rich. 
And he says to them, every time I remember you, I get grateful. I get joyful. So, good lesson for us. Are you spending as much time building relationships as building your career or trying to make money? When you're with people, do you actually express gratitude towards them? I wonder how many would say, "Uh, I complain to God every time I remember you. (laughs) In all my prayers, I pray, God, why can't you change him? Why can't you make her different? Why can't I just have healthy, normal people in my life? And if God spoke audibly, he'd say, well, they don't exist. Can't, can't get you one. An auditor told a friend he had made a spreadsheet of all the mistakes his wife had made during the last six weeks. Now, no wonder he's depressed. And imagine his wife, probably ex-wife by now, when she discovers he's running a flaw audit on me. Now, lots of us wouldn't do it on a computer or a spreadsheet, but we do it in our mind flaws, mistakes. Here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love keeps no record of wrong. No record of wrong. So if you're married, quit bringing up what he did 10 years ago or what she did 10 years ago. Love keeps no record of wrong. In fact, if you're a believer, God has no record of your wrongdoing and says, I will remember your sin no more. Now, let's get like him, because I got a lot to remember as Cindy. So I'm preaching to her right now, you know. Love keeps no record of wrong. So if she says anything at my eulogy, you remember I told her that. Doesn't keep any, somebody skin what she's going to say, all right? Make sure it's the good stuff. So the book of Philippians is a thank you note. They prayed for him, supported him financially. They were concerned for his ministry. They were partners with him in the gospel. And this is a great point this morning to say to all of you who partner with us here at Summit, your giving, your service, your faithfulness, your support means the world to me and to Cindy, and I couldn't say thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what I really, really mean. I try to get around, thank people who are serving, thank people if you see them in the nursery, thank you for being with us today. I try to walk around, greet people. I want them to know, I really am glad you're here. Uh, You not being here wouldn't be nice. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you got up, took the time, spent the gas money to come and be here. I really, really do appreciate it. It's nice to be appreciated. I like to go to a good restaurant where I think, at least, they appreciate me coming. It's much easier to give them my money when I think they actually like me. They actually are glad I came. Right? Well, okay. Then, now, having said that, you'll close your Bible or your iPad. You'll walk out today, headed to the car. You'll pass 352 people. You won't say a word. I know. I know what goes on. This is a big stage. You know that? This is a big honking stage up here. I tell everybody, I said, you got to get a head start. Now, don't wait till they call you up. You got you to get a running start to get out here. <laughs> you go through menopause before you get over here right now. It just takes so, so long. <laughs> By the way, laughter does good like a medicine, the Bible says, too. See, some of you getting healed right now. All right. Fourth observation, last. The happy life is rooted in where you are physically, financially, vocationally. The meaningful life is rooted in where you are spiritually. One more time. Happy life is rooted where you are in your circumstances, physically, financially, vocationally. Oh, I'm happy. The meaningful life is rooted in where I am spiritually. Paul's writing to the Philippians who are geographically in Philippi, but spiritually in Christ. Now, there is a relationship between happiness and place. Researchers wanted to know who's the happiest, people living in California or people living in the Midwest. So they asked them two questions. Number one, how satisfied are you with your life? Two, how satisfied are you with your weather? Midwesterners were just as happy with their life as people in California. Now, they weren't as happy about weather, outdoor activities, the beauty of outdoor surroundings. But why weren't Midwesterners 
less happy overall because no place, no external situation can ever bring you internal happiness. Can't do it. Paul says the location that matters is my spiritual location. He said you are actually a follower of Jesus Christ and a slave of humanity temporarily residing in Philippi. So I don't buy into the ladder climbing, status seeking Philippian way of life because because what matters most is not a mountain view or ocean front. Nothing wrong with it if you've got it. What matters most is that I'm in Christ. It's not where you are, it's whose you are. It's not what you have, it's who has you. You are in Christ. That means Jesus is with me, in me, by me, and for me. Jesus is the one working through me, standing beside me, going before me, watching over me. He's got my back. He's got my heart. He's at my side. I may be in trouble. I may be in debt. I may be in a hospital bed. But if I'm in Christ, I'm good to go. Good to go. And if your spiritual location is in Christ Jesus, your geographical location can be any sucky place on earth, and your ultimate well-being is not at risk. If I'm in a bed in the latter stages of stage four and God isn't healing me, I'm good to go. I've got an eternal life. I've got nothing to be afraid of. God is there with me. If my time is now up, I'm still good to go because it's not where I am. It's whose I am. I'm safe. I'm confident. I'm comforted. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm alive. I'm not, in, I'm not morose. Not at all. So, joy is not a feeling. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is not a feeling. Joy is a pervasive sense of well-being. And only God Almighty, not a Ferrari, not a gated community in the Dominion, not, not uh, the latest uh, designer dresses, clothes, or gold jewelry, only God has the capacity to make everything well in your life. So Paul doesn't just say rejoice, he says rejoice in the Lord, because Jesus is the great joy bringer. In John 15, 11, I've told you these things that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. John 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Joy. Rejoice because the master of all has become the servant of all. He humbled himself, made himself a slave, became obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. The God of joy became a man of sorrows so that the children of sorrows, you and me, could become the children of joy. He switched places with us, see? And we tried him and beat him and cut him and crucified him and buried him. And on the third day, God said to the world, I'll give you something to be happy about. And a tomb, the ultimate symbol of death and despair, defeat and disgrace, became on the third day the happiest place on earth. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for joining us today, and may God richly bless you. For more information on Summit Christian Center, visit summitsa.com.